All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back for part two in our three-part series here on the podcast, How to Get What You Really Want in Life, Money, Manifestation, and Intuition. I am here again with not just one, but two of my special guests, Manifestation Babe herself, Catherine Zenkina and Jennifer Finley. First of all, Catherine, how are you doing? I'm doing excellent, especially being with you guys. Any day with you guys is a great day. Same. Totes. (laughs) Jen, how are you doing? Oh, fabulous. I'm so excited for this episode. I am too. I am too. We're going to talk. This is very conversational. There's no interviews, okay? I mean, we can interview each other, but no one is the inter- the solid, unified interviewer, interviewee. We want this to be a three-way dialogue, conversation, and back and forth. And in this episode particularly, the topic is going to be around the discussion of manifestation. Obviously, Catherine, this has been your wheelhouse since day one. That's really exciting. Since the womb, baby. Oh, the woo, She puts the woo in womb. <laughs> Been wooing since the womb. It's not like it's her favorite topic or anything. No, I know. Do you ever get sick of talking about all this stuff? Honestly, no. The only thing I struggle with is when complete strangers ask me what I do for a living. Oh, yes. And then I get all sorts of like, here we go. Okay. All right. How do I begin? Where do I begin? Yeah. I honestly what do you say? develop this I developed a strategy. I just give them my Instagram handle and I'm like, you're going to figure it out. Like, Here's <laughs> I that. Do they yeah. start immediately treating you like a magic genie? It depends. One time I got into an argument with a Uber driver, oh. actually two of them for some reason, because I learned to just not get into it. With right. The this wrong is what I was telling you, Jen. I don't, yes. I don't have the energy right. for it. Totally. I realize I don't have the energy for it. When you're One new, when did, you're new, you're waiting for everybody to ask you, right? <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. When you're brand new, like I was driving to, um, this Uber driver was driving me somewhere and he was like, what do you do? And I like kind of tried to explain things and he's like, ah, so you lie to yourself for a living. And I was like, oh. actually, you know what I do? Listen, we yeah. can lie to ourselves about bullshit that doesn't serve us, or we can lie to ourselves right. about bullshit that does serve us. Either way, we are essentially lying to ourselves. So it just depends on what stories you want to tell. Yeah. And that determines the reality that you create. And literally this guy DM'd me. He found me on Instagram three days later, the Uber driver. or maybe even like the next day. And he's like, you changed my life with that <gasps> one statement. I'm like deep in your podcast now. Oh, I've scrolled wow. your entire Instagram account. I bought all the books. Like I love this. And then another guy, it didn't work out so well. (laughs) Ah! Okay. (laughs) But wait a second. I want to start with that because like, you're so right about what you said is like, we're already lying to ourselves. When we say I'm no good, I suck. I'm a loser. Like what's wrong with you? Like that is us lying to ourselves. And we know we're lying to ourselves because we like feel like when we say it, but I don't, I would actually challenge you guys. I don't think you're, if we're talking about something that we we're talking about intent and we're talking about a decision to cause, create, uh, attract something into our life that hasn't happened yet. I don't see how that's lying because I love that quote that I shared at the mastermind, which we'll have to bring up, which is, and I forgot who it was, William Blake. Do you know what I'm talking Mm -hmm. about, Jen? So the quote is something that I'm going to bring it. Actually, will you Google it while I'm botching it for our audience in real time? Joe Rogan style. I love this. Yeah. Uh, Will you you Google this conspiracy theory for me? Um, (laughs) 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 um, Oh yeah, there it is on NBC. So it's something to the fact that William Blake said, like when the doors to perception are cleansed, you will see nothing but infinite possibility. Mm, I love that. And so when you talk about manifesting as something you're choosing, is that, did I nail it? It's so close. Thank you. When the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is infinite. Boom. Boom. Bingo, bango, bongo. And so like, that's truth. That, okay, that, like, that's truth. So when here we are, we stand in this moment of time, the present moment right now, and we look to the future. If we see anything that isn't infinite, it's already a lie. So mm-hmm. we are choosing one to collapse one. I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, Catherine. You were just choosing to collapse one of the infinite possibilities and say, oh, that's the next one I want. And it's like yeah. looking at, it's like a giant jar of Skittles. And you're just going to say, I, I want one. And you just pull on and you grab one. And to me, there's nothing lying about that. 
So I appreciate that what you did was you like totally reframed it, but it's like to me, I, I don't use his language. Yes, obviously yes. we're not that was lying you, manifestation Linguis aikido. linguistic jujitsu. She took totally. his energy and then flipped it so he had nothing to rebel against. Yes, it's like well, you already and, are lying to yourself, so yeah, at least yeah. at least lie about something at least you want. A good lie. That's so good. <laughs> so um, that's beautiful. Let's let's start with with Catherine. I've shared my definition of manifesting, but when it, someone goes, okay, what do you do? And you're like, I teach people how to be a badass manifester. And then someone says, what does that really mean? How do you define that for yeah. the average person? It's so funny. One time, I think it was like back in 2018, I was sitting on the beaches of Costa Rica and I was like, I feel like I need to come up with a one-liner for those kind of people that aren't familiar with the secret, have never heard of it, or have never heard with like the basic concepts of manifestation. So I just define it as like when something that was once a part of the imagination becomes actualized into physical reality. Mm. That's oh, like the wow. Simple... Let's say that again. Slow down. So when something that's a part of your when, imagination, when something that was once a part of your imagination becomes actualized into your physical reality. So can we say that the more imaginative you are, the better manifester you can be? Absolutely. Yeah. Because you're able to tap into that infinite space the better your imagination is mm -hmm. because if your imagination ain't that great, you're really just like speaking of the metaphor with the Skittles, you're reaching in, but these are other people's Skittles. Yes. They're your mom's Skittles, your dad's Skittles, right. your grandparents' Skittles, kids from school Skittles, you know, your teacher's Skittles. And mm -hmm. so it's the ability to create your own Skittle jar. Uh -huh. I, yeah. I and it's like, that. why are we limited to Skittles? You know, <laughs> what about exactly. M&Ms? Yeah. Or Kit Kats, Reese's Pieces. <laughs> You know? I love that I mean, you use take... the word imagination because it links that there is a connection between the visual element and bringing something into 3D reality, which I think we can get into later mm -hmm. about the way that visual cues or visual reminders, yeah. visualization, well, meditations. I, and I like it too because I think that's something that I've always tried to do is keep that childlike you know, wonder and creative play in my life. I'm mm -hmm. always daydreaming. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I, I don't do it today from a, I think I've changed that association with imagining. It's like, it's literally like I'm in an Amazon shop in my mind. And it's like, well, I'll put, it, I'll put it on my wait list for maybe my wish list for later, or maybe I should get it, or I'll just leave it in the checkout cart and come back and sleep on it. But it's not like this, oh, that would be nice. If only I, wish. If only I could. It's like, that's I don't, only for rich people. That's only for certain types of mm -hmm. people. And it's yeah. just like, no, it's just, what do I want? Yeah. With nothing else attached I to it. I found a, an old report card the other day. My mom collected these things and like, a, I don't know, she brought them to LA with her because she, she divorced my stepdad and brought, you know, half her things to LA. And she just handed me this report card. I think it was from second grade. And you know how the teachers leave comments. Mm -hmm. My number one comment, there was like three or four report cards from elementary school. And it said she daydreams way too much. Oh, like wow. Catherine wow. is constantly daydreaming. How and I'm like, you? yeah, and that's yeah. why I'm successful, bitches. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's so sad. When did those things right? get, get, I mean, that's, and that's the whole thing is like, I actually really sympathize and understand, like we've been doing a lot more of the woo content on social and, you know, the backstory for me, Catherine is, is as you may know, you know, before I was doing the things I was doing on this podcast, we were talking YouTube and video. So we we're talking about frame rates and codecs on your editing softwares and, you know, what kind of, uh, what kind of video camera you want to use. And it was very nerdy technical stuff. It was actually, ironically, it was about 70 to 80% male audience. And now it's flipped, like exactly flipped. And so I'm starting to post a lot of these clips from the podcast on the YouTube and the YouTube shorts. And those followers are kind of coming out of the woodwork and commenting on it. And man, like they're, they shut it all down. Like it's the same kind of things as the Uber driver, you know, like, yeah. oh, so you're just, you know, full of it. And you're just like, oh, you're just playing pretend or, oh, you're full. One video was like, this video was great until he went all, all woo on us. <laughs> and it's like, I actually really sympathize with that. And I think that's something that I've always felt honored to play a role in is that as Jen knows, because she's known me for 20 years, I was one of those people. 
Like I was mm-hmm. so, I wasn't like Catherine in the third grade daydreaming and saying one day this will be mine. <laughs> da, 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 da. I was no, so 3D. No, no. I was so logical. <laughs> I was so like, you either work hard, sacrifice your life and be somewhat successful or nothing. And then you die. You know what stands out yeah. to me as a memory of you back then was being out to dinner and you asking me to make an argument, but this is a credit to, (laughs) this is a credit. No, I love this because even though you were skeptical, you were interested and curious and you asked me to make a logical argument about why Zodiac signs might be for real. Yeah. Is the astrological signs like, how could that have anything to do with who you are, your personality. Yes, but I did make a case for the energetics of the principle behind it. Yeah. Even if you don't believe in, you know, this, the, you know, like they say Vedic astrology is different than astrology now, but I was making a case for, it's a concept that your energy is connected to all the energy in the universe by an invisible thread. And that energetic vibration has a cyclical pattern that repeats. And so at that moment that you decide to come into consciousness, you choose to enter the 3D reality at a time when you are a match for the vibrational reality of what's already occurring on the planet. And we've categorized that into 12 different characteristics that you could call the zodiac signs, but you could also just look at it as what vibration was happening at that moment and even where the planets are, where the stars are, where the constellations are, all of that comes into play and it makes your birth time this not accidental thing, but this beautiful miracle that's interwoven and connected to everything that is alive. And in that moment, I saw this little twinkle in your eyes and go, oh, well, that I might be able to get behind. I just can't get behind the New York Times printing out fortunes for everybody and saying, this yeah. is what's going to happen yeah. your day on Tuesday, yeah. you know? Right. Yeah. But I like the idea too, just like, well, you know, if the moon can affect the tides yeah, and we're made up of mostly water, yes. that, that is enough of a logical thing yes. for me. But let's talk about this because I think it brings up a great topic that I actually did a little like TikTok kind of open the door to this the other day, which I find so fascinating is that for me who I was traditionally was very logical, very reasonable. Like it had to make 3D sense. It had to satiate the left side of my brain. And it becomes this really interesting relationship with manifesting. And I don't know if either of you want to talk to that to some degree where it's like people don't get on board with it because it doesn't seem to fit the logical model of the world that they already have set up in their brain. And I think it's, you know, that's kind of the point because it like exists beyond that. But I wonder if either of you two can can speak to that at all. Yeah, I think like being someone who can be so logical, if we want to bring astrology into this. Do you feel like you are? Do you feel like you're traditionally more logical or? Here's the thing. So it's hard for me to remember like growing up as a young child because it was such a traumatic childhood that I actually have so much of it blocked out. Like I don't really have memories before the age of nine. So when people ask me like, you know, people, psychics will tell me, Catherine, you're very psychic. Like, didn't you see things as a kid? I'm like, I have no memories before the age of nine. I don't know. So I don't really know what I was like as a kid, but I can tell you who I was programmed to be. And that was to be this very scientific, logical person, like by my mother, because that was the key to success. The key to success was you read the books, you get into the science, A plus B equals C, like that kind of stuff. And it wasn't until literally just my friend in her living room just handed me a book and said, this is how my grandpa has everything that he wants. And he doesn't work for money. Money works for him. And just for some reason that made so Mm -hmm. much sense to me. And I was like, I'm sold. I want money to work for me. Right. And I just got curious. And so I read the book and for some reason, it's like, I can only explain it on a spiritual level. This is what opened me up to spirituality. It's like the universe got me on the path that I'm supposed to be on. I was not supposed to be a doctor. I was not supposed to be this scientist. I'm supposed to be this intuitive soul who came here to transform her life and help other people transform their lives too. And what helped me break free of that so instantly as well, when I look back and something to help people is like, yeah, We can mold things to be logical and we can say that logic is the only way and the 3D is the only way, but we have to ask ourselves, is this producing a happy and fulfilling and successful life for me? And if it isn't, 
there's got to be another way. Yeah. And I've working? always looked at yeah. life when things are not working out for me, I'm not going into the definition of insanity, which is doing the same thing over and over and over again and getting the same result, which is not the result that I want. I'm constantly questioning. I'm like, all right, I've done this 85 times and I'm not getting where I want to go. So there's <laughs> got to be something else. There's got to be another way. And I think that that is what keeps me open to dive deeper into other things, like deeper yeah. into astrology, into human design, into working with a shaman, right? Like that's what gets me into these places because I'm like, all right, I'm not yet where I want to be. There's got to be another way. And then I get into those things and I'm like, whoa, this is awesome. Like this is a different way of thinking. It's producing a different quality of life for me. I feel a tangible difference, even if there isn't a shift right away, just feeling more clear, mm -hmm. more free, just happier. Like what is wrong with that? There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But it's it's interesting too, is what you said is like, you know, it wasn't my path to become a doctor or, or you know, go the traditional path. But but then I can argue or ask, but was it your path to go down that path to of have course. the contrasted experience? Yeah. You know what I mean? And I think that's of part course. of the journey that we have to honor and appreciate. Like I look at, you know, because Jen was a huge part of that in my life. So she saw this very like I tapped into my dad, you know, he was the hardest working person I've ever met in my entire life. And I adopted that model. Mm -hmm. And it was, mm -hmm. that's, that's how I'm going to do this. I'm just going to work harder. And that's where that whole, you know, and that, and Jen, you were, you were around for a bit of that, but I was like popping the, the Adderall and I was in front of that computer for 14 hours a day. Yeah. And, Ooh, and that it was the same All hustle, but, hustle and hard oh work. Oh my gosh. And I had no complaints about it. Like no. literally just like, let I'm here for it. Yeah, totally. I think that's a whole nother conversation. I try to not complain about anything as much as I can. You know, it's like, if you're going to do it, you might as well just, just do it or not do it. But like doing it and complaining about it is kind of just like extra taxing. Yeah, but I remember there being a phase in around 2008, 2009, where we started to identify that you had a belief that there was a prerequisite that in order to be successful, you had to work your ass off. Yeah. And then you had to challenge and dismantle that of, could it be easy? Is there a way that you could also yeah. be successful and have rest and ease while Big doing time. that? Yeah. Yeah. But you know, like I love that that's part of all of our journeys. It's well, like the I, same. I'm the opposite. I, I, I do want to get into your yeah. origin story in a moment, but like <laughs> si very similar to Catherine is like, you kind of hit this, this mode. You're like, well, I might as well, if this isn't working, am I adaptable and flexible enough to try a different way and just experiment and observe and say, can I try it this way and see? And that's how it started. I mean, like the, we're skipping years of the whole process, but it was like, okay, fine. I'm willing to test this. Mm -hmm. You know, when my mom and sister who you know very well, came home with the secret and oh, asking it is given Abraham Hicks. And I took that and I looked him in the eye. I said, don't you ever give me this hocus pocus like, rubbish, puppy rubbish, cock. puppy cock. And I threw it in a garbage can in front of them. Like I was so like, but what was your thinking behind that? Because I'm now I'm curious. I'll tell I you. I feel like I'm so far away I'll tell from you that now. Is, yeah. Where I want to know what your thinking was. Well, there's the con were. okay. Well, yeah. So there's the conscious thinking, but then there was the yeah. unconscious. And so what was happening was is I had decided that I have to work hard to be successful, and I had been working hard, and I started reading that, and it's like, no, you don't. Like that's not it. And so it just threatened what I had are, it's like, if, it's like if you start building your dream house in your dream town and halfway done, someone says, this is not where you should build the house. This is not the town it should be in. And it mm -hmm. shouldn't be like that. You'd be like, screw you. I've been working yeah. at this for, how dare mm -hmm. you say that this is wrong? And that's what it was for me. And I wasn't willing to look at it. And I've told these stories before, but it was Jen that was the totally I to blame as the gatekeeper for me. And yes. it was when like, I was not actually open to this stuff at all until ironically I made some money. And that's one of the reasons why I believe my journey was so like long and arduous and slow before any, like four and a half years with nothing, like just zero and working harder than anyone I ever met. And it was the moment when it all came in and I had to partner with somebody else. Like I couldn't even do it on my own still. It was like, they kind of like compensated for where I was like lacking and they assisted, and then I, I made a bunch of money. I still felt insecure. I still felt worthless. I still felt the same, like, 
you know, in my mind perception, this pathetic kid that I had always just kind of was seeing myself as. And that's when I went to a really dark place. And I was like, well, I was so freaking stubborn that I was willing to keep trying that old strategy of like just the 3D efforting until your eyeballs bleed. And I got somewhere with this and I don't like where I ended up. Mm. And I said, something's wrong here. Something's off here because it was like this, I still feel worthless though I have the money and I could look at the bank account and I could like feel like something just was still felt wrong with me. And then I had this like, do I have to work even harder to fix this? And I didn't want to. And so uh, that put me in a chokehold. That was like a soul level chokehold of like, are you ready to try it the right way, kid? And then Jen, who I, we still can't decide who broke up with who. But (laughs) after we broke up, being the better person and wanting to rub it in my face, uh, no, it was pure unconditional love, sends me these CDs. And I've told this story before. People reach out all the time and they're like, I kind of, but she sends me these like the day after Christmas, I open them. And it's got this beautiful note from her and that and I thought had a poem. Being, yeah, she wrote a poem for me. Like, <laughs> come on. It's like, you just, okay, I get it. You're the better person here. And those CDs finally cracked it all open for me. Well, I was always wow. looking for a way in because um, you would bring up this very valid point where there were many, many mentors or examples in your life where people had manifested amazing things. And at the time I was studying to be a healer in a lot of different healing modalities, yoga and Reiki and, and meditation. And you kept saying, but if it's about attracting abundance, why are these people scrapping it? Like I had a real, I had a real problem with that. And and I, I remember offering like, well, what if that's not a goal of theirs? Mm -hmm. And, And you were like, I understand if they don't want to be wealthy, but we're talking about, they have financial issues like they have an unhealthy relationship with money Mm -hmm. and so I was always looking for an example that I could point him towards of this is someone who's actually an entrepreneur that's applying this and doesn't have a belief that you know money is the root of all evil and you can attract abundance and when I found those tapes I was like I got it I got the doorway in for James and those were the Kevin Trudeau. Wait, what tapes were they? Okay, okay. So it's the your wish is your command. Yeah, your wish is your command. Uh-huh. And it's, it's I like will 14 say, no, I, I seriously like set. those tapes that Jennifer Finley sent to me changed my freaking life because when I tell people about these tapes, I'm like, that guy has kind of a bad reputation. So I don't know, like. I think I've listened to these. The YouTube comments were very, like, everyone was like, make all kinds of mixed feelings. All so kinds of mixed all feelings. All kind of feelings. But for whatever reason, I was at the right place at the right time. And I heard those and I was so open to it. Now, here's what happened next. I was 14 hours. So it was a total immersion experience, right? And then at the end, he recommends books to keep going further. Yes. And the first one is these Abraham Hicks books and The Secret. <laughs> that you threw away. Yes. That I threw away. And I was like, trash. oh my God. And as soon as he told me, that, you know, yes, you can read these. I was like, okay, fine. Now look through the trash, but it'd been years since the trash had come. Nancy pulled it out of the trash. (laughs) But I started doing these little experiments and they worked like little things. And I was like, holy crap. That was the beginning of a huge change. So before we go any further, Jen, like I know you grew up with like traditional Christian values? <laughs> like, is this, was this stuff the devil? No, like, no, no. I was going to say, fact, like, the very, religious programming. That oh, the, well, no, I have a totally different, from. um, totally different background than the two of you, which is why I admire how far you've, like, 180 flipped on not only believing in the law of attraction, but the application of it. I grew up in a family on both sides were Irish Native American. Not sure my dad's Native American heritage, but my mom is Comanche bloodline. And they've done lots of research and go back and back and back. What is the beginning of this bloodline? And difficult to pinpoint exactly, but the living relatives that recall, all of them have said the same thing, that we are descendants of Kiwana Parker, who's a very well-known Comanche psychic very bloody past. I started looking into the history of this. And, yeah, and like anytime you try to aggressive. read, yes, when you try to read books on my ancestors, I'm like, Ooh, this is not my, this is not my energy, but this my, isn't the British baking no, show. No, no. <laughs> but my, my great, great, great 
grandmother walked the Trail of Tears. And everyone in that bloodline, they had an agreement that all of us had a tremendous amount of psychic ability. And the women in the family would tell the other women when you were about 10 years old about the the gift, air quotes. And so I remember my grandmother sitting me down when we were 10 or 11 years old and telling me and my twin sister, identical twins, and saying, we have a gift, we're able to read each other's minds. It was always presented to me inside of the family, that the family has an intuitive capacity, and we would call it sending messages. So they would tell us, like, if you send me a message, then I'll receive it. And these things would happen routinely. My dad would walk into the house and say, Tamara, I bought milk and bread and she'd go oh good you got my message or like i remember <laughs> there were no home, texting no no then. texting back then i remember flying home from university and thinking on the plane i forgot my toothbrush and toothpaste and i had gotten it crest had just come out with the vanilla mint flavor and that was my new favorite flavor toothpaste and i come home and on my dresser there's the exact same toothpaste tube that I had just bought a week before and a toothbrush sitting on the counter. And my mom said, I got your message about 2 p.m. when you were on the plane. No text message, didn't tell her, just came home and I went, oh good, you got my message. So I grew up in this context of extreme psychic ability and it just being really normal. Like when I was four, I walked up to my mom and I had lost this pencil that I loved. It was one of those pencils with little teddy bears on the top. Yeah. And fuzzy. I lost it. Yeah, the little fuzzy teddy yes. bear on the top. And I lost it and I said, I want to find my pencil. Who can assist me? And I probably didn't say assist. I'm a little girl. I'm like, who can help me find my pencil? And I heard a voice that told me where it was. And my mom said, oh, you found it. I was going to help you. What, how did you find that? And I said, my guides helped me. My angels told me where it was. Instead of being like, oh, no, 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 we Shut don't, that not, down. That, no, no, you're not <laughs> hearing voices. It was, oh, good, you're talking to your angels. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. What did they say? And we had a, a relative that passed away when we were 10. I came, me and my sister came downstairs and told my mom, we saw Mimi and she wanted to tell you she's okay. She's in heaven with Papa and they're having blueberry pancakes. And my grandmother and my mom looked at each other and we were referencing my grandmother's husband who we had never met. He died three years before we were born and his favorite food was blueberry pancakes and they had never shared that with us. So that was like a, whoa, how are the children doing this? But also as an identical twin, you have a high level of psychic aptitude just oh, with course. your twin. Yeah. So I grew up in this really rich environment where, you know, my dad's father was a motivational speaker that taught people how to, what he called it, crystallizing your dreams, crystallizing your vision. So he would host these workshops on Stop how to it. manifest so cool. what you want. And we grew up with that as being normal. Like yeah. we were playing sports at 10 years old and my dad has us parked in the parking lot in his Volvo playing. I don't know why he chose that our meditation music was Queen, but he'd play. Makes sense. Yeah, another one bites the dust as yeah. loud as possible. And he's got us, okay, girls, now I want you to visualize every single so awesome. inning of the game, every move you make. What does the scoreboard say? Who wins the game? By how many runs? What are you doing? you got to see it and visualize it in your mind. And you start from the minute you walk into the dugout all the way through to the moment you win the game. And we would sit in the car for half an hour before every sports game and visualize the scoreboard. And then after the game, he wouldn't ask us what the visualization was. And afterwards, he would be like, and was it what you saw? And we'd be like, yes, it was exactly what That's I saw amazing. in my mind. So I grew wow. up with it. Yeah. And so when I met James, when we were 20, and he didn't believe in any of it. And she walked up to me. She goes, hi, my name is Jennifer, and I manifested you. <laughs> Actually, we were, I did in a way. We, I, I had two majors and a minor in college, and I had too much time to ever date. And I needed a date to an event. And my sister said, I got the perfect guy for you to meet. And I was like, so okay. Your sister manifested. Yeah. And, but yes. And so I was always thinking of ways to like introduce it to him in a way that was palatable. And like to your line, Catherine, there was a point in my, when I was working as a healer and I was working as an intuitive coach and a psychic, when I had to come up with my party line answer for when people say, I don't believe in that. Because that would, yeah. I, I spent years not even, I would never say the word psychic. I would say I'm intuitive or I can sense things, but I was very uncomfortable saying psychic. 
especially growing up in Texas with lots of Christian background and just not wanting to invite any skepticism around it because there was a time when it really shook me up if someone was skeptical. And then I just realized, oh, I know exactly what to say in this instance. I remember one of my friends saying, psychic, huh? I don't believe in that. Why don't you believe in it? And he was like, well, I've just never seen it really be real. And I said, really? Have you ever seen a tiger? And he said, no. And I went, how do you know they're real? And he was like, well, I mean... Uh, and I went, yeah, same with me. It's okay if you've never seen it, but I live with it every day. So for me, it's real. And then he just stopped and walked away. And I was like, okay, finally came up with a way to present to people. You don't have to see it in order to know that it's real. When I was five, I had one of those fuzzy pencil topper teddy bears. And I I walked up to a girl that I had a crush on. Her name was Claire Shonsby. And I said, here, I want you to have this. And it was white. She goes, where did you get this? I said, oh, I found it because I found it at home. And then she walks over to the gym teacher because we were in gym class and they're talking. I was like, what's going on? And then he stops the gym and he goes, did someone lose their their pencil stopper? (laughs) Did someone lose their little teddy bear? And that was the last day I had a crush on her. Oh, (laughs) well, lucky me. (laughs) (laughs) And that's my random story. (laughs) Wow. We'll cut that from the final episode, but we both had a, a fuzzy pencil stopper. Yeah, we topper. also discovered that we both had the exact same Halloween costume when we were at the same three age, or four years old. What is Catherine, that with that? I got to send you a photo the exact of this. Same it is the exact same costume. Clown. We're dressed as a clown. It's Maybe the same everyone costume, our age at that age. like It's funny. And you know what? And, so our, and we're also wearing the same shirt in our kindergarten picture. And we have weirdly almost the same haircut because I had a little like bangs and I got it. I'm wearing a pink polo shirt. James is wearing a blue polo shirt. We're posed in the exact same way. It's It's hilarious. That's freaking crazy. Isn't that funny? I've seen those TikToks where it's like they, husband and wife look at their childhood pictures and they realize that like the husband was actually in the background of the wife's picture. Or like something like that, you know? Wow. Wow. Insane. But do you ever like meet anybody and you're like, wait a second, wait a second. We used to go to that same restaurant. That's my parents. They were within just like such it's close proximity to each other this for years a, oh, before they Brennan. met. Me and it's all, yeah. it's all like simulation, that. guys. Yeah, yeah, it's just, yeah. This is just a simulation. None of it's real. Here's what I, here's what I want to dive into. I actually want to offer two things because I don't know if one of these topics could go for another five hours here. So I'll let you guys choose and maybe either one of you. I wanted to either talk about like where the gap is where it's like, because I think we both, I heard both you guys talked about this in your own way. Like people that know about this stuff and believe it, but there is a gap in the application of it. And I'm wondering yeah. like, what's, what's preventing that or how, you know, people's like, yeah, I should be manifesting more or to go even more specific, Catherine, I'm curious, do you have experiences? Cause I've noticed a lot of these recently where people will come to me and share with me that there's contextual manifestation, oh. meaning in, they can do it in one area and they do it in one area <gasps> oh, all no. the time. Yeah. And they realize like, I've been doing it with my love life but I didn't even think about doing it in my business. Oh, and wow. It's kind of a subset of the same conversation around application. Like some people can apply it in an area, but for whatever reason, they've decided it doesn't apply in this area. And I'm wondering if either of you guys want to start that conversation. Like where's the gap in the application? Okay. I can definitely take both for sure. Let me start first with the gap. One thing I've noticed from manifestation becoming this like big buzzword where there's mm-hmm. a bazillion TikToks you know, made about manifestation. And I'm always watching them and listening and just seeing like, what is trending? What are people talking about? And it wasn't until I had Nylon Magazine interview me about a specific manifestation strategy. I think it was like the 369 method or something like that. And at first I'm like, what the hell is a 369 method? They were coming to to you saying, this is- They're coming to me. And I forgot what it was exactly. That's mom brain for you. Like my priorities are obviously on Orion now. So I like forget, like I forgot my whole life before Orion existed. But anyway, it was right before he was born and I was writing this article and I was like, I need to Google this. And it goes to show you like I'm a manifestation coach and I don't even know these rituals, right? right? I don't even know these techniques. And I realized that so many people, they get stuck in thinking that manifestation is something that you do for like 10 minutes in the morning. Right. Mm-hmm. And then you, and that's it. Yeah. Or like you yep. have this other thing. It's like, I need to sit down and manifest right now. Yes. <laughs> and, 
<laughs> to me, that's so silly because I have thought that way before when I first got into it. And now it is something that is so a part of me. It's in the every single moment mm -hmm. that I am embodying manifestation, meaning if something comes up that I don't like, or I don't want, or it's a pattern, I'm immediately examining the pattern, like on the spot. I'm like, what mm -hmm. belief do I have going on yes. that is creating this reality for me? I don't like this contrast. What's the thing I want? What do I need to focus? What do I need to shift? Like if this is a 24 seven process for me, and it's not like I expend all my energy 24 seven on it. It's just an embodied thing for me. It is not something I sit down where I'm like, okay, I need to meditate to manifest this morning. Right. And those things help. And a lot of people think that it's the tools that are manifestation. They don't realize that the tools assist the manifestation process. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people think manifestation is the 555 method. The 369 method is the meditation, is the journaling, is the specific prompt. Yeah. Those things are assisting what it actually is. Yes. And what it actually is, is an energy that you embody mm -hmm. 24 seven. So when someone cuts you off on the freeway, how you react is manifestation. What you're thinking about as you're driving, what you're daydreaming about yeah. is manifestation. How you're conversing with people is manifestation. What you say to yourself as you look in the mirror, that's manifestation. All of it is manifestation. So I see a huge gap there and I'm constantly reminding my students, I'm like, yes, we can get caught up in all these tools. Sure. But they're assisting the process. They are not the process. Mm -hmm. sure. I think this is really profound because I feel like I've had that experience that I feel like the longer I've been doing this and the more it goes into an unconscious confidence, the less it feels like you are doing. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, and it's not yeah. a separate process. And I think that's a really important thing to bring out. And it really reminds me of that Don Juan quote, which is everything is about the doing and not doing at the same time. And I think that's the, that should be the goal for everybody is like, I think when you're finding yourself in that place, more often than not, there's a level of mastery or unconscious competence that's starting to happen because it becomes everything and nothing at the same time. The yeah. exercise almost stretches out into your entire day. It's like that notion of like, you can meditate for 10 minutes and then go back into like your sulking. Yeah, exactly. Versus like bring that meditation throughout the whole day. It's like driving the first time you learn to drive. It's like, Oh God. Okay. Open the car door, get inside, mm -hmm. put the keys in the ignition, yeah. turn it on. Yeah. Right. Check the mirrors. And now we just, we're not even thinking about driving as we're getting in the car to drive. Right. But I feel like so, you're still at the same time. Like there's, are you doing anything that's like constantly like, okay, what's next? What's next? Because I, I will be dead honest. I have definitely hit moments in my life and I don't want to stay here too long where you go like, oh crap, like everything you, I manifested it all. And, I didn't even knew and this. you caught and it caught up with you. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. And it's just like, what next? And it's like, I don't want to, we call that like no man's land, right? You know, you're, yeah. you're kind of like, there's nothing motivating you to move away from something, but you don't have anything like pulling you forward. So are you doing discipline of like, what's next? What's next? No, I let it be. I go with the cycles. So I have mm -hmm. cycles. Like for example, 2022 is a very quiet year for me. It was mm -hmm. not very much like pushing on anything specific. It wasn't like this has to happen by the end of the year. It was just me enjoying what I've created so far yeah, and feeling like I don't necessarily know what's next for me. And that's like a scary thought because but like I'm learning so to be okay. used to and le yeah, learning yeah. to be okay and knowing that in the right timing, I will be inspired by something new mm -hmm. in the right timing. Like for example, we just, we're going to Las Vegas this weekend, which by the time the podcast comes out, like people will know about this. So we're going to go see officially the house that we're moving into for 2023. And I've been meaning to move out of LA for about like a year, year and a half now. And it just wasn't working. And it just wasn't, I, I, I didn't know what the next steps were. And I just knew that there's something next, but I couldn't get myself to really focus on anything. And whenever I would it would just frustrate me. I don't know. I just felt like tension around it. And so I'm just like, whatever, I'm going to let it go. I'm just going to be. Mm -hmm. And when the time is right, it's going to align perfectly. And that's exactly what happened. And now after the birth of my son, and especially being pregnant, being pregnant, I felt the most unmotivated in terms of work. And as soon as I gave birth, it was like, it's not like I have a new purpose, 
it's like my purpose expanded, my Mm -hmm. mission expanded. And all of a sudden I'm so excited about life. And now I'm in that, like, okay, what's next? What can we do in the business? I can recreate my course and make you more effective and let's sell it for this. And And I'm just like, all of a sudden in that that. beginner's Catherine Mm -hmm. mindset of just, this is the new beginning. Let's start some new shit. But I also, I love all of that. And I also love what you were just saying about like, there are definitely times when you're like, don't know what you want next. And I think it's very easy to go into a total breakdown. Oh, how for do, sure. How, how do you train yourself to be okay with looking out into the void of the future and it's nothing but an unknown mystery and not have a total panic attack? Yeah, I just, you know, I, I, I use the metaphor of seasons. You know, winter mm-hmm. feels like it's forever, but it ends at some point. At some mm-hmm. point, the seasons turn to spring at some point, the seasons turn to summer. So it's just trusting the seasons. And I use the past a lot, not as a way for me to get stuck into something, but as a way for me to reflect on past lessons that could be applied to the future. So I always think Mm -hmm. about, okay, was there another time in my life where I felt like something was never going to end, or I felt really inspired. And then something came around the corner, or did I ever feel like I was unclear about something? And all of a sudden the clarity came. Yes. So it's going to happen again. Yeah. So I just like kind of learned to look on and I explain this to people. If you ever ask me, Catherine, where were you when this happened? I'll literally tell you the date and the time. Brennan is just baffled. He's like, when did we go there? And I'm like, December 16, huh? 2019. It happened at 12 PM <laughs> right after we did this. When I was wearing what yes. he said, what we yes. argued about. My dad's like, like and who the bachelor was that year. Yeah. Who There's the actually a 60 was- minute specialist about it's, it's a particular type of memory that they 60 minutes did a whole special on people who remember every single day of their life. And my dad watched and was like, I can do that. Wow. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. So that's I, Catherine. If you give me that's context, Catherine. It's not, it's not like I can sit right now and think exactly what I did this yeah. time last year. But if you ask me a question that's worded in the proper way, I mm-hmm. go, bam, that time, that yeah. day. So I use that to my advantage. And I really use this like timeline in front of me where I'm like, okay, here's the now, here's the future, here's the past. All right, let's look back. Did this work out in my favor when I did it this way in the past? No. Okay. So it's gotta be another way for the future. Yes, it did. Okay. How did, like, I just, I'm like a little, I don't know. I'm like a little mad scientist, you know, how have you ever pictured or have you ever seen, or I don't know, this is what I picture where there's like this crazy mad scientist, just like writing things all over the whiteboard. And it's just Mm -hmm. like a million things. That's me. Yeah. That's literally me. <laughs> yeah. I picture myself like Tom Cruise in Minority Report when he's got the computer. Zzz, zzz, he's moving things zzz, around. Yeah. It's like, that was so like yep. that was so innovative back then. Yes. I feel like that's right around the <laughs> it's probably already happening in a bunch of places, but I think that probably. in one thing that's really key and pivotal to manifesting is focusing on the what and not the how. And I think people Even, focus on the how, don't know how, and then they say, therefore, it's not possible. That, but when you say, yeah. like, what's next, a lot of people, when they ask what's next, they're actually thinking about how. Yes. Like, for example, or if I go... what is it going to what, look like to yeah, get there, What's it going to look how? like in the yes. 3D, which is the how, yes. versus coming back to what do I want to be experiencing? Mm -hmm. How do I want to feel? And I learned a long time ago that gratitude is the cosmic flypaper for everything amazing in your life. And actually they've done all these studies about how gratitude is the most powerful magnetic emotion. Mm -hmm. Even if you look at like water crystals, when you, when you start speaking words into water, then the water will react and form different crystals based on the words and maybe it's, we can link this up in the show real notes, funny the study. Co- it's a real but, funny cosmic joke though right because there's something if you kind of just like get present to the to the unspoken essence of wanting something it's a very thin line where we want something yeah but not attached no 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 but wanting something because what you have isn't mm. isn't good enough which mm-hmm. is absence of gratitude. Yes. And so then I think people get into like, oh, manifesting is just like asking the universe for what you want. It's like, no, people have been doing that for a long time yeah. and not getting a single thing that they want. Yeah. It's like, yeah. how do you want from a place that is also from gratitude? Yes. You know what I mean? Like wanting without saying, because what I have right now sucks. 
the wanting implies lack. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. Like sure. A, yeah. Yeah. A yeah. lack of whatever you want or a lack, even just a lack of gratitude. I think I love Esther Hicks mantra. The better it gets, the better it gets. Yeah. Going back to Kevin Trudeau and your wish is your command. One of the distinctions that's made in those tapes that I thought was like almost the missing ingredient to a lot of the manifestation books that I had read before listening to that program Water. is that <laughs> is that it's down to your belief and your desire and your believability has to be at a 10 and your desire has to be at a 10. And what usually happens for people is when you're in the presence of, I want it, but I don't have it yet. Your desire is at a 10, but your believability about getting it. If you feel lack or you don't feel good when you think about that, that's because you don't mm -hmm. actually believe at a level 10 mm -hmm. that you could have it. And I started playing around with that concept of like, are the things that I manifest really quickly, the things that I desire at a 10 and I believe at a 10, I could absolutely have it. That could appear right now. And when I started mapping it out for me, the things that I was reaching for that I was really attached to, or I was coming from a place of, I'm so upset that I don't have that yet. I really wanted it, but I also had some level of deep belief that there was a barrier to it coming in, that it was going to take mm -hmm. a long time. It would take a lot of effort that I didn't deserve it. I wasn't worthy of it. And once I started to increase the believability, which we can get into like tools. I love yeah. tools and tactics of how do you do that? But it's yeah. really a, not just about what do you want, but it's, do you believe you can have it? And do you believe it can come to you easily? Mm -hmm. I have a very powerful tool that helped me break through financially. Like it was the difference maker between me going from $9,000 in a year to 600 K. And year. that's wow. all we have for today's episode. <laughs> if you'd like to continue, subscribe to our paid podcast at $1,000 a month for one episode with Catherine sharing oh her Oh my God, I love you guys. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, you set that up okay, so I'm giving you guys juicy. a I feel like I'm waiting. This is good. So, I'm going to milk this. So, I mean, it's so simple. It's ridiculously simple. And I labeled it. I gave it a name. It's called the ladder of believability. Mm -hmm. So it plays into exactly what you said, Jen. Desire is at a 10, but belief is at a two. So how do you bridge the gap? So breaking apart the goal where you are creating smaller stepping stone goals that are leading you into the direction of your big goal, but isn't something so extreme to where it's like, no matter what, just thinking about it causes you stress because you're like, I don't know how I'm ever going to get there. Yeah. I've yes. never like, for example, when I made $9,000 in a whole year in my business manifestation, babe, the next year I wanted to make, well, you know, my desire was to make a million dollars but that's such a huge jump for me. Mm -hmm. And at the time I haven't even made like a 10 K month. And so I knew I had to start somewhere. And what I ended up doing was I set a goal of a hundred thousand dollars for the year. Now, some people might be like, Oh, so you downgraded your goals, right? You committed a huge no, no in manifestation where you are playing smaller, which you aren't. I'm still thinking about the eventual million dollars, but yes. what I'm doing is I'm breaking it into segments and breaking into stepping stones. Yeah, you're so taking a little myself, layover, a little layover on the flight to a million. Exactly. Exactly. And I love that you said that. So it's like, for me, I just see myself stepping on this ladder. So I asked myself, okay, all right, how much do I think I can make in a month? And I answer that question with like, okay, two grand. And I'm like, all right, let's stretch it just a little bit. Let's do 2,500. Mm -hmm. So I set my goal for 2,500 and my believability behind that was like a nine or a 10. Mm -hmm. So what ended up happening, I manifested that the next month. I'm like, Whoa, okay. I did 2,500. Could I do 5,000? How does 5,000 feel to me? And it was like 10 believability, 10 boom. I did 7,000. Wow. And it was like, all right. Okay. What's the next stepping stone to that? And I'm like, you know what? And I would play, I would ask myself 8,000 too easy. Like believability 27, right? 20,000. <laughs> no, it still feels like a five. Right. So I'm like, okay, what's next? 10,000. All right. Boom. I would do like 15,000. Then the next month I'm like, oh my God, 25,000. I know I could do 25,000 believability nine or 10, whatever. And then I ended up seeing 25 K months, 30 K months, 50 K months, 80 K months, one after the other, after the other, after the other. Mm -hmm. And mind you, my goal for that year was $100,000. I ended up with 600 K. 
because wow. I removed yeah. all of the resistance yeah. behind that goal. Yeah. And I worked with my belief system, not against it. Yes. A lot of people are in such a rush to make that big goal mm-hmm. that they think that if they don't make that big goal, they're a total failure. And I'm here to encourage people that it, it is okay. And you can give yourself permission to break things down. Like who cares if it takes you three years to get there? you freaking get there. Yeah. Because year three to four could be like this quantum. You just, you know what I mean? Like you could go in in your fourth year, you could 10 X, 20 X, like, and you had to build that foundation. You're working with it. And I want to say two things to this first is that, you know, as you're saying, like be okay with those small wins because they're the stepping stone or the rungs on the ladder. I've said this before. It's like, I think I want to see more people grateful on, on those rungs. I think it's easy to see everyone else and, and be like, I'm not there yet. But then you, what you're mm-hmm. left with is it's not enough. And then it's the absence of the gratitude, what you, what you were talking about, Jen. And I'll tell you, the, one of the best manifestation hacks you can do, and I've, I've heard people that are just like so 3D dense, don't talk about this stuff at all, and they will give the same advice. And it's you celebrate yes. every one of yes. those rungs. Because even if you don't want to use the word manifestation, all these are they're just all labels and words that humans gave to universal things that are already happening. We could put this under a neuroscience, you know, brain science kind of conversation to say just the same way you would Pavlov or train a dog, you're linking a positive full body experience to a specific set of actions and behaviors that you just you training yourself reinforce and reward, reinforce and reward. And I think if people started celebrating more the first sale they got, you know, it's really, it's always sad to me. I try to bite my tongue and it's no judgment, but it's really sad to me when someone's like, well, I did my first launch for my first thing that I've ever done with no list and no audience and only two months in business. And I only got four people to give me money. (laughs) And it's like, those are four human beings that took a chance on you where you didn't have the years of experience of doing this or all the testimonials and the results and da, 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 da. And it's like, if you're not grateful for four, how could we expect more to come in five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten? I think that's really important. But there's another piece I want to add to this. It's really interesting that you talk about this, Catherine, because I actually talk about it from the other angle. It's like the way I'm hearing you is like, I thousand percent agree that it's like, we have to find where that level of believability is for herself. But I think that there's two dials. The dial that I'm hearing Catherine play with is the size of the manifestation. Tone it down for now. But I've also played with time. Oh, yes. Such a good point. And you can play with both. If I sit there and said, okay, $10,000 this month is like, seems a little outside. And we go, okay, let's bring it down to 8,000 next month. You go, okay, I can do that. And I said, okay, how about 8,000 by the end of tomorrow? Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, that's crazy. So we just, we just cranked the time deadline up to a tomorrow. And all of a sudden your believability went back down. And so what Mm -hmm. I'll do with people is they're like, I'm about to do my first launch and da, da, da. And they start to collapse and attach their entire future, which by the way, full circle moment to Catherine talking about seasons as a metaphor, but not just a metaphor, actually actual literal description of life being seasonal. It's temporary. And I think it's easy for our brains to go into something as more permanent than it is, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm going to do this promotion, this project, this business, this idea, this partnership, this whatever, and everything's riding on it. There's a sense of permanency there. There's the, if this doesn't work, it'll never work. This is the one all be all, you know, viable experiment that proves if my future is going to pan out or not. You know, that's been scientifically proven, actually. I learned that when I was a fitness instructor, that human beings naturally produce an experience that pain will last forever, which is why when you're doing something like teaching fitness, they instruct you to count down from you have eight reps left because your human brain naturally thinks I'm in pain and it's never going to end. Yeah. So I got to get in. That's labor. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's that sounds more accurate though. <laughs> Day of that, but what I've done with clients is when when I see them in that like like let's just say like two or one believability level, and they're just in a very dark place, I'll stop them and I'll say, "Let me okay, okay, hold on. What's the goal again? You know, whatever the goal is, you know, it could be like to fill this program, to get their first ten people, it could be to have their first six figure year." And I go, "Let me just ask you this: Do you feel like this is something that you're meant to do?" And they go, yes. So I follow up and I say, so do you believe that this will happen in your lifetime? 
and their entire state changes in an instant. Oh, their shoulders drop. They go, well, yeah, of course. I go, then who the f- cares? What else <laughs> matters? If you know how this story is going to end, then what else matters? We know how it's going to end. And it's the same thing you're doing, Catherine, but instead of yeah, dialing up and, or dials. down the results, you're dialing time. It's like yeah. the self-imposed deadline that you're giving yourself yes. isn't serving you. Yes. So, now, sometimes it does. I've read a lot of the manifestation books and they're like, give the universe a deadline. It's like, not if it's going to freak you out the whole time, because then it's like, yeah, never well, it's, for it really it is, never it works really for is me about, either. Um, never. The way that it makes you feel. For yeah. some people, when you write that date down, it makes them feel like, yes, it's scheduled. Now yeah. it's going to happen. And other people experience time like time is the trash compactor Star Wars walls oh my gosh, that's so closing true. in on them, producing this experience of pressure. And then when you uh-huh. expand the container of time, all of a sudden there's no pressure yeah. anymore. And pressure is a killer for possibility. Yes, it is. Well, pressure puts you into survival mode. Yes. Yeah. Or prove real, it real mode, pressure. you know? Mm-hmm. If yeah. people want to know what real pressure is to the unconscious mind, it's breathing. It's someone literally closing your mouth and nose. And all of a sudden that pressure builds up like mm. I need oxygen mm-hmm. now. And so our unconscious minds, when we put that much pressure on ourselves to achieve a goal, it literally puts us into fight or flight. Yes. Yeah. Constant fight or flight to where we could never be in, in our intuition, which I know yes. is the next right. episode. Yeah. Well, yeah. And you can't have, like, I feel like one of my strengths in business has always been problem solving. Yeah. Like I just, just, there's always a way. And I just know that. And it's like, that's a fun way I like to use manifestation is like manifesting creative solutions. And I'm just allowing and trying to stay in a receptive mode to receive a creative idea and say, how can I turn this adversity into actually a huge opportunity? You can't do that in fight or flight mind. You can't do that in right. a constricted no. pressure-based state. I think that's where you really have to understand how you operate though, because like that's that, you know, you can't go with a cookie cutter method, which is actually one thing I've really taken away from working with our shaman, Don Javier. He'll say to all of us, and he said to me specifically recently, I know you want me to give you the, the one, process. the two, the three, yes, and the four. The process. But that's for uh-huh. you to discover. And yeah. when he said everyone's that to different. me, everyone's, everyone's different. different. And that's the thing is like when you read a goal setting book or a manifestation book and it says you absolutely have to write it in this way or you must put a deadline. If you write that date down, for me, I would call myself a pressure player. I've always been that way. My family tells a story when I was in eighth grade playing basketball, I was fouled and it was like up to the the free throw game winning points and I was being heckled. Who is heckling at a at a middle school basketball game? I don't Get know. A as, life. A, as a grown adult, I'm like, why was that even happening? I think this is the but, same people leaving comments on my TikTok videos. Yeah, well, you know, so <laughs> I was being heckled, but I kept I made the shot and then the crowd would quiet down and then it would start again. Just you can't do it, you know, you know, what it's the loud. Heck? So what the um hell? I know. But I turned to the crowd and I gave them this signal like pushing my hands up in the air like yeah get louder and then I turned around and I made the shot and my dad always used to tell me that story to reinforce it and to anchor it as you're a pressure player remember when you told the crowd to get louder Mm -hmm. that's how well you play under pressure (sighs) so for me I know that I'm a diamond I need that pressure baby to make me perform Always sparkling. <laughs> but I do know like being a goal coach and actually working for Lululemon for years, we had a formula of this is how we teach people to do goals. You have to have a buy win. You got to have a deadline. When's it going to happen? And I would encounter a lot of people that putting that date there all of a sudden immediately started to mm-hmm. produce pressure and decrease believability. And I didn't have that context for it. It worked for me, but I think that's really important that you approach the methodology of how you manifest from a place of curiosity. And like you said, Catherine, I love that you said that you were playing, that you were coming at it from, I'm going to play. You have to, you have to keep that. You can't lose that. And I think that's the other side of it too, which is that man. And we've been, you know, Don Javier has called us out on this so much and it's like so important. It's like you play and then create. And then now you lose that because you're afraid of losing the thing that you just created. Yeah. And yeah. it's no longer yes. it's no longer play anymore. And it's like, would you really manifest something if the moment you were going to manifest it, you were going to spend the rest of your time and energy just trying to hold on to it? Mm. And it's like, then you missed the whole point. It's like you you tapped into the power that creates. And then the moment you say, I need to hold on to this, you're losing that. 
Yeah. Because you're thinking that it's now in this thing that I hold in my hands, not in the thing that allowed this to come into its existence. It's so true. I think that's where like once entrepreneurs and business owners specifically start getting successful, that's the thing that takes them down. That's the thing that keeps yes. them stuck. I've seen that so much. Like we see that with our coaching programs in the mastermind, like people get to a level and it's almost like monkeys swinging from branch to branch. And each branch is like that next plateau or level in their business. There's that free fall moment where you actually have to let go of one to grab the next and they won't do it because they're afraid to let go of what they've created. Yeah. I was just going to quickly say there's a mindset I developed because every launch felt like all this pressure and it felt like, oh my God, if it's not as good as the last yes. one, this I means know. horrible things that. about me, right? It has I, to keep I growing stopped. or whatever. Yeah. So for me, what really helps me lose that fear of like, you know, losing something was just instead of seeing every step, a lot of people see, and this is exactly what you were saying. A lot of people see all of those checkpoints or destinations or manifestations as the end points. And I started seeing them as the beginning. Mm. Everything is just the beginning. So whatever I achieve, if it's, for example, last launch, we just went through a launch. So this past launch is just the beginning. So whether it went our way or didn't go our way or met our goals or didn't meet our goals, or it was more money than we expect or less money than we expect, it doesn't matter because it's just the beginning. I'm yes. just getting started. I started to approach everything I do in my life. Every single podcast I release, I'm not attached to the download numbers anymore. I'm not attached to my Instagram post likes and comments anymore. I'm not attached to anything. In fact, with our last launch, we lost half our email list. How? Don't ask me. Weird crap. You misplaced happened. it? Forgot where it you put was it? was like technology. No, it was just like it just got deleted. I don't know. It, oh we were just gosh. not unable to all of a sudden market to half of our list without explanation. And instead of freaking out about that, I just told myself like, whatever, in the end, I'm going to get what I want. Like you said, yeah. in this lifetime, I'm going to get what I want. And every single day is just the beginning and nothing will mean anything about who I am as a yeah. person, as an entrepreneur, as a mom, as a wife, yeah. as whatever label that we want to add, whatever identity that we embody at different stages of my life. Like nothing actually means anything about those things. And every day is a beautiful day to get started on something new and embody a new energy. I love that. And I think I want to add on top of that, that I think something that I've really tried working on and cultivating the last couple of years is actually to simplify my life more. And I feel like the more I start to simplify my life, like, you know, need less, do less in, in all that sense, you find that it's easier to be completely detached from all the things that you're doing. And the notion and the theme that I think a lot of entrepreneurs go through is it's this, okay, I want, I crave, I desire, you know, the growth, the money and all that type of stuff, because it's somehow better over there than it is here. And, you know, it can be I'm just going to be straight up. Like it absolutely can be like money can take so many big problems and turn them into minor, minor conveniences in your life. You know, you can stay at a nicer hotel. You could buy a bigger home. Like, yes, it's, it, it, there is a 3D fact to it. But we do take our shit with us wherever we go. And if you have financial money issues now, like chances are you're just going to take that with you, even with more money. And it's very easy for us. And I think like I went through this, you know, and I think people with like new money go, most, most people go through it. It's like all of a sudden you're making more money, but you're spending just as much, you know, as you're making. And mm -hmm. I've shared those stories before. And all of a sudden you're like, there's nothing left over, even though I'm making five times as much. And that's also that same thing where it's like, now it has to get bigger. Now it has to be more. And it's like, I think there's something really beautiful in simplifying your life. And then you get to, and I think that's something that's really served me and helped me because like everything I do is not, I never want it to be necessity. I never want it to be any type of need. I want it to always remain play. And the amount of times I have called my students and clients out in this where, you know, there's a lot of method to the madness of us teaching this beta launch process that we do. And there's a lot of people that poo poo it, which I love that. Bring it on. You guys realize that I'm just like Jen and I love, I love a good pressure. <laughs> like you have no idea how much you're serving me when you want to 
you want to try and push back on. He tries to manufacture it sometimes. Oh like my he'll, gosh, he'll say I to instigate me, it. And Jen, you told me I couldn't do it and look at me now. And She's I'm like, like no, I, I didn't. never said that. Oh, I'll just go on Instagram <laughs> some days and I'll be like, you told me I wouldn't be able to build this and look at me now. And it's like, no one ever said that. No one said like, that. I know, but Everyone that's what. Everyone said they believed in but you. But in my mind, that's how I <laughs> motivate. Yes, that's how you motivate. Him, so just mm. let it be. Yes, yeah. let it be. Mm. <laughs> just let this weirdo be. But I've had students that'll get in that same thing you're talking about with their launches. And I'll be like, hold on. Cause I remember that first beta launch that you did that did so well. You told me this is just a fun experiment. I got nothing to lose. Let's just see what happens and let's have fun. And now you've lost that and you've lost it because it's no longer simple and light and just, what it is. It's now the stakes are higher and I've got something here that I got to preserve or a reputation or something. It's like turn your business into a job. Yeah. And a really crappy one, you know, and that, and that happens to us all, I think. And we just need to keep reorientating. I found myself there before I've absolutely have. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's not what I want. When I find myself doing that, I can remember the moment when, and I found the doctor's name, it's Dr. Emoto, the hidden messages of water. Did he pass recently? Did I hear something about that? I'm not sure, but we can link up his book in the show notes. But I remember having this moment of realizing how powerful gratitude was and then having this understanding that actually the best way to hang on to the results you've already produced is to just be grateful. And that for me almost felt like a relief when I realized that because it was like, oh my gosh, there's not more for me to do except for say, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for this. And that's the most powerful way to maintain it. Mm -hmm. And there's a proverb that I read once that I say almost in every meditation that I lead is if there's one prayer I learned my whole life, let it be this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And to me, that's been my secret sauce to manifestation is if I find myself getting in a place of attachment or pressure, or I mean, the kind of pressure that's taking you out of believability or deep, deep desire, but also not feeling good when I'm thinking about what I want, I take a moment to pause and go, wait a minute, I got to get back into a state of gratitude. And I've been trying to practice that as well, or I've been practicing that also with the challenge that arise, because if I can be grateful for the problem that's arising, I'm more likely to arrive at the solution. So there's oh, that, yeah. And there's that yogic concept of, you know, the mountaineer needs the mountain, but you're given mm-hmm. the challenges that are required to produce what you really want. And we're all setting goals or desiring things in mm-hmm. not just to get that thing, but to become whoever we need to become in order to have it or to have an experience on our way to that or Amen. when we get there. So if I can start to be really grateful for, thank you for this challenge that's arriving now. Thank you for this problem that's presented itself. What is it going to bring into my life to learn how to overcome this challenge? Yeah, yeah. And how, then that's where starts am I going to grow? Where, where yes. am I going to strengthen? And that actually starts to magnetize solutions. Yeah. Dr. Emoto passed, well, it was a lot longer than I thought back in 2014. Oh, wow. By the way, oh. fuck Wikipedia. Like, he was a pseudoscientist who claimed that human consciousness could affect the molecular structure of the water. What do you mean claimed? He proved it. Not approved by the FDA. I mean, like, are, it's, <laughs> like this, this grinds my gears, you mm-hmm. know? Like, mm-hmm. we're going around, like, people doing something that, oh, it isn't the mainstream fit the box of yeah. science. And we're like, Trust okay, science. Let's, let's put on the internet and, and, and just, like, in vain with someone who's passed who did some um, incredible work that yeah. has been uh-huh. scientifically proven... Let's put pseudo in front of it, which is basically like a scientific middle finger F you. Well, I actually think that's a good thing to point out because when people say, oh, I have a hard time manifesting, it's like, cut yourself a break. The world that you live in right now is not designed or set up to encourage you to be empowered in this way. It's not even meant to lift you up and like, it's meant to... To ridicule you if you're even if you even talk about this yeah, stuff. Yeah, that's we're gonna get into this when we start talking about intuition because I deeply believe that I already the knew society that, we bl- we live intuitive. in now is actually I think it's intentionally architected in a way for you to turn off 
intuition. Oh, yeah. So when people say like, oh, I, I'm not intuitive or I don't have that gift, I always go, well, don't worry. You've just been living in a place where you haven't been taught, encouraged, or in an environment that would facilitate You've that. You've been living and, in a dream, Neo. Yeah, and we can start to turn the volume yes. up. Yes. Well, it's like, yeah. what's that show that just came out with season two that's with Buster from Arrested Development? And it's literally like the C I'm, I'm trying to remember this because I watched it as soon as it came out and it was like a year and a half ago and now season two's out. But like they're like literally the show is like, he's like broadcasting some frequency mm. out into the world. And it's like, that's how it feels like is that there is, you know, Catherine and I talked about this in the first episode is the, is the drift. Yeah. Yes. And I believe that the uh-huh. drift is a yeah. frequency. Mm-hmm. I believe that it's, uh-huh. There is a, a frequency, and if you allow yourself to tune to it, it'll take you down. Don't believe you me. You have just... to be your own advocate. Like that's yes. what I figured out. Living in a home where absolutely zero people supported me. In fact, they actively <sighs> yeah. tried to bring me down when I decided to start my own business and forego medical school and do my own thing. And it was just such a threat, right, to my parents and their whole viewpoint of what they thought a successful child would look like. And of course, you know, parents very often, depending on the success of their children that reflects on their success of parenting, right? Mm-hmm. Which totally doesn't. We have to disconnect mm-hmm. that. Our children don't owe us anything. We're not responsible for their, we can guide them and we can help them become who they're meant to be. That's like a whole other thing. That's not my point. My point is, is that I did everything in my power to listen to podcasts, YouTube, books, audiobooks, 24 seven. I had the frequency that I wanted in my soul playing at me at all times of the day. I was that crazy lady that listened to affirmations going to bed at night. I literally had Bob Proctor saying money flows easily and effortlessly, (laughs) whatever his affirmation is all night long. And I would wake up and I would immediately listen to audiobooks, podcasts, YouTube, because I knew that the whole world, my immediate home, my immediate family, and just the world at large is against this stuff. They don't get it. And in order for me to become successful, I need to be tuning into the right frequency actively being my own advocate, not waiting for someone to tell me, Hey, Catherine, like this works or doesn't work or tell me what they think or give me their belief systems. I had to develop my own. And I had, and I had to do, that was my experience too. And it's exactly why I created this podcast. Cause I was like, I'm not yes. finding enough of that where it's also like for the entrepreneur. And I have to imagine Catherine that it's like doing that must've felt like you're a, what do you call like when a, the first part of a seed, when it's kind of like the seedling or the initial the sapling, yeah. the sapling <laughs> busting through like frozen tundra soil. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's you're defined uphill yeah, barefoot in the snow, both, both ways. Yeah. That's for 30 <laughs> miles. But it's like, you know, just to break through the little seedling to break through this like frozen ice desert void of nutrient, void of everything, like everything. And it's not to be negative, but it's like, it really feels like it's an environment that you have to cultivate something in an environment that is void of what you need in order Mm -hmm. to thrive. And so you have to create that. I'm just seeing the Tupac album of a rose blooming in concrete. That's Catherine. With eyes wide open. (laughs) (laughs) Catherine, have you heard the Cahill Gibran poem on children? That just everything no. you were, oh my gosh, you've got to, I'll send it to you after this, but okay. wait, is that said, who played he says Wonder Woman? Exactly what, no, is it, he's a wonderful poet and he, he has a, a beautiful book that he actually, he wrote a collection of poems called the prophet and he carried it around oh, with him course, for yeah. two years because he wanted every word to be just perfect truth. Wow. I think that's so beautiful, but it's my favorite poem, but he wrote exactly what you were saying that your children aren't your children. And he has this line in the poem where he says, you are the bows from which your children as living arrows are sent forth. Mm. I would like to get into more of what you guys are talking about, like leaving room for and inviting everyone to experiment and play with their own methodology of how to become a master level Jedi manifester, but to get into what are the mindsets? What are the tactics? What are like Mm -hmm. Catherine saying this ladder of believability? What are the specific things that 
we all do that produce that level of magic I would in say, manifesting. I would say the first thing is you got to start looking at evidence of what you've already been successful at in your life. Like there's no way anybody listening, if you're listening to this podcast, you've manifested a phone and a set of headphones. So you've done something right. And it's very easy for us to just discount and discredit where we are. It's not enough, right? Because you're always looking at what could be and you're looking at the gap of what's missing and that's already a part of like, okay, you're deep manifesting, but you've done something right. You've done things right. And I think if we just took time to look back, because that is success, success leaves clues. There's an internal strategy there that we can go, what was I doing to make, to call this into my life? Declare the past things that you've created miracles and say, what, how did I approach that? What was I doing then that I didn't do here? And Jen helped me out with one of those because years ago I called her for psychic guidance and I had secret a secret weapon. Yeah. And I had this really <laughs> failed promotion and I told her, I said, I knew this wasn't going to work. Obviously this could go great in the intuition episode, but she's like, well, that just shows you're intuitive. Right. And so even when I didn't get what I want, I got evidence. Yes. Of, I teach this and we got to break that apart. Yeah. So I think, I think that's a big thing for me is just like, you know, look at what has already is working and isn't, isn't working in your life. Yeah. So you're reverse engineering. You're reverse from engineering. What, yeah. And then what, how I repeat yeah. that? Yeah. I have three little rules that I've produced for myself because I love little formulas. So I have three R's that I use. Step one. Step one. No, it's more principles than like a, a step process, but there's three R's that I use and it's reminders, repetition, and rehearsal. And I try to do all three of those when I'm setting myself into a state of manifestation. The reminders, I want to do visual, audio, and kinesthetic anchors. When I learned NLP and I learned that you're receiving information primarily visually, auditorily, kinesthetically, I started becoming obsessed with the way that my brain processes and takes in data. And so then I thought, well, man, if you're trying to manifest, what if you could give your brain these anchors throughout the day that are reminders of what you want? So you know, my living spaces, especially a bedroom or an office are just covered in pictures that are anchors and visual reminders of things that I love that I've manifested or that I want to call in. And I try to produce also like a feeling or a sense in my physical space so that as I'm looking around the room, we'll talk about this in intuition too. Like I have anchors, visual anchors that are my spirit guides or animal guides where when I'm looking around the room, I have a reminder of I'm guided, I'm gifted. I have manifested all of these things. And then I try to repeat out loud or in my mind with a thought or a mantra, or I'll change all my passwords to like a goal that I want. Oh yeah. So that I have to repeat. I, I have yeah. to, Oh, you do? Yeah, I do that. Yes. I love oh, that. Yeah. So, and that's yeah. that repetition. Like I type it out over and over and over and mm -hmm. over and over. And then the mental rehearsal, I do it in two ways. One is meditation because I'm a meditation teacher. So I love, I love the vehicle of sitting down to meditate and mentally rehearse a future that you want to live into. And I've created many meditations for myself that's around creating a memory that hasn't happened yet. And then the distinction of like, what makes a, a memory different than a movie? So when I learned NLP, disassociation and associative memories, associative memories are the ones that are more powerful and that's how we generally remember a memory that produces a lot of emotion is like you're living in it, not you're seeing yourself through it. Mm -hmm. And actually when you're teaching people to dismantle emotion, like if you want to dissolve a phobia or a fear, you teach people to see themselves in the movie. And I found really quickly when I was teaching goal setting, a lot of people when they go to meditate about their goal are putting themselves in the movie and they're like watching a movie about something that Someone can else. happen to them instead yeah. of trying to conjure up a memory mm -hmm. of the future. And then I also do silly things like, and I know I got this from your wish is your command, but to, to do a rehearsal of like, what do you really want and put yourself physically in that environment as if it's already happening. Like I remember in 2008, before we lived together in Laguna, I was actually manifesting that I would move to Laguna Beach and I would drive down there and sleep in my car and wake up at five in the morning and go running. Like I live in Laguna. 
you know, and and then a I don't year know if I'd later, recommend that. It sounds dangerous. No, today, I, but, well, um, this is this is in 2008. <laughs> yeah, and in a tiny little beach town. In, in but Laguna, I also yeah. I've I've done it before. Like I remember one of my first apartments in Austin. I had really lucked out in Los Angeles finding I got like grandfathered into this amazing apartment deal. And when I moved to Austin, I was like. I am not paying more rent than I paid in Los Angeles. I refuse to do it. And I decided that I was going to find a one bedroom apartment for a thousand dollars a month, which if you, I mean, I, James is making a face. It's like, no. Good and luck. I remember all my friends telling me, first of all, you can afford more than that. And second of all, you're never going to find an apartment that you want to live in that costs that. And I thought, challenge extended. I'm going to manifest this. And I said out loud, I want it to be a one bedroom apartment that feels like I'm in this little tree house where I can walk to my yoga studio every day and I want to live off of Bluebird Lane. And I would get in my car and every day when I finished teaching yoga, I would drive around the neighborhood that I wanted to live in, but I would pretend like I was driving home. And I would kind of like manufacture this reality of I've just finished teaching and now I'm driving home. And I kid you not, a week later, this student that I had never met walks into the yoga studio and goes, do you guys allow people to put flyers up? I've decided that I'm going to sublet my apartment because I'm mm -hmm. moving in with my boyfriend and it's just so adorable. I can't put it on Zillow, but I just made the flyer today. And I said, where is it? She said, it's across the street. And I said, how much is it for rent? $1,050 wow. a month. And then I go to see it. And I had all these other, I'm like, okay, but it has to be on the second floor and it can't have a smart meter on the side of the building. And I really want to feel like I'm in a tree house. And I walk in the unit's 201. It's on a corner, no smart meters. And she looks at me and goes, isn't it so cute? We call it our little tree house. Oh my gosh. And I was it. like, what? Stop and it. so like, that's where I was like, you know, that it's rehearsal, repetition and reminders yeah. that I, for me, that's my formula of like, if I'm going to manifest something intentional, that's how I do it. Yeah. Catherine? I love that. So I really love the passport thing because I, I love to use technology. So I'll do, you know, my vision board is always the background of my computer. It's always the background of my phone. I have my password as whatever I'm manifesting at the moment, which gets really annoying when I meet it because then I have to change all my passwords. <laughs> like, all right, I got to upgrade my passwords. Yep. So it's like a million passwords. Something I do that actually is a great visualization tool. A lot of people are not using social media wisely. A lot of people are using social media to go online and see what their friends are up to and compare themselves. Like, where am I and complain. Where am I uh, ma matching up or not matching up to my yeah. friends or whatever? And I use it as my personal vision board. Yeah, so that's good. especially when I'm manifesting something, let's say I, I, I want to manifest like this is like way back. I want to go to Bora Bora, Four Seasons Bora Bora. It was like a huge trip of mine that I really wanted to manifest. And that hotel is like thousands and thousands of dollars go on YouTube and I watch vlogs of people who have been there, who are sharing their experience there or their reviews or whatever luxury hotel people. And I'm just like consuming as much. So I know that every single detail of this hotel, exactly what the water looks like, exactly what the food looks like, exactly what the restaurants look like, exactly how the flight is, how short it is, how long it is, how you get there, all these things. I'm obsessed with all these details and then I use that for my own personal visualization material. So then I will literally see myself and I have such an accurate depiction of what this hotel looks like or what this home looks like or what that country looks like or whatever it is. Or, you know, if I want a specific bag, cause I'm a purse person. And if there's like a specific bag that I'm manifesting, like back in the day, it was like my first Chanel bag. I'll go watch people unbox Chanel bags or yes. I'll go into the <laughs> Chanel store and try yeah, on these the bags, I'm immersing myself mm -hmm. as much as I can into the environment. And then hypnotherapy is like my number one manifesting tool. I love hypnotherapy so much. And there's a hypnosis that I develop that I teach my students, which I guide them through it. But for myself, it's something so easy that anyone can do it. If you can put yourself into a hypnotic state, like you can just do it by yourself, or you might need someone to help you do that. But I envision myself coming into this home and then there's like a specific room that I walk into every time and it leads downstairs to a movie theater. And what I do is I, I imagine seeing the like exact popcorn machine that you have in one of your Airbnb. I was going to say, this yeah. sounds like, like, this sounds like James's Airbnb. Mm -hmm. like <laughs> it does sound like it, but it looks different. 
and I see like the popcorn and I see that I have like a, like someone who is bringing me drinks and bringing me the popcorn. So I'm like literally sitting and then I'm watching it like a movie. I love how you said, you know, watching the movie because I literally will sit down and watch myself on the movie screen, experiencing something over and over and over again from as many angles as I possibly can while in hypnosis, I'm in a theta wavelength. Mm -hmm. And then I jump into the screen. So then I associate. Yes, that's I associative. Yes. And I associate. And I just do it from as many angles as I possibly can. And then I literally see myself put the popcorn in the trash. And then I give my drink back to this guy. I walk up the stairs. I walk out the door. I drive out the driveway and I come out of hypnosis. I love it. I it's love it. Time. I don't know why. It I is love it. This hypnotherapy in general, I always hire a hypnotherapist to help me with anything I want to manifest. Like for example, the week that I conceived Orion, I came into my hypnotherapist's office. I go see someone and I was like, I want to manifest getting pregnant. She's like, all right. And we didn't get pregnant the month prior. So I'm like, I know that I can hypnotize myself into doing this. So I went into hypnosis. She did it. And she gives me a recording that I listen to every single night that week or no, the next week, which I saw you guys while I was technically pregnant, but I didn't know when we were in Sedona together. And then three days later after that, I found out I was pregnant. And I remember coming back to her the next week and I'm like, well, I'm back because ah. I already manifested the last What's thing. Next? So I love need- it. I need new material. Yes. Catherine, do you remember when we first met? I think it was in August. And I said, we were doing a a reading and I looked at you and I said, are you trying to get pregnant? And you were like, um, no, maybe. (laughs) And, but Orion was in your auric field then. And I remember like, I remember afterwards going to James going, she's going to be pregnant really soon. Cause if they don't, if they don't want a baby, she better be putting a guard up because they're <laughs> he's coming. He's, he's coming. He's there. Well, <laughs> the whole, the whole Orion thing is for the intuition episode. Cause that his name, the way his name came wow. to me, it's insane. The stories and the synchronicity yes. that I have around. And, and Orion. the, uh, we can tell all the stories I have every time you're coming to the house with Orion, he's like coming on yeah. to the television. And you know what? There's a really cool one that happened with you actually manifestation, Catherine. We had just been out to dinner with you guys. And I didn't think that we were going to see you one more time before you left. But I woke up in the morning and this is my like set it and forget it. The station where I just do the Esther Hicks, like, wouldn't it be nice if, and then you just, do you just leave it there for the universe? Like James, your Amazon store in your mind. I woke up and I thought, oh, we're out of almond milk. Wouldn't it be nice if someone just delivered almond milk and we're out of groceries? Wouldn't it be nice (laughs) if groceries just arrived at the house? And one hour later, there was a ding dong at the doorbell. Brennan brings like a Costco size. Like, I mean, bags full of groceries. Here you go. We don't want it to go to waste. And Catherine goes, oh, and I put my favorite almond milk in there. And I went, oh, my gosh. I manifested the manifestation babe delivering me my manifestation. It's brilliant. Okay, wait, wait. So I love what Catherine's bringing up here as this movie projector because playing the or sympathizing with the skeptic for a moment. Some of this stuff is just like, what? This doesn't make sense. Like, how? Where? You know, where's the science and the understanding of it? And it's like, well, you know, you have to go beyond 3D to really even begin to to understand it. But something that's really helped with me is is it's not about just like okay, manifesting means visualize it. And then that means it reminds me what I'm working towards. And it gives me a little bit more motivation and keeps me inspired. Like that's sure that will help, but that's not it. And if we use this metaphor that I've used in the past, which I really like, which is that your consciousness, which is like, which is like a flashlight is like that movie projector. And so if you imagine your consciousness as a movie projector, and your thoughts and emotions become the film strip, Mm. then you're just deciding what is playing in the movie next. I literally share that metaphor in my course, like that exact metaphor. And, And you have to look at it from that level of craziness. Like I look at it as like, I am generating this hologram. What do I want popping in? And what do I want popping out? And I'm just there to be that projector and consciously intentionally put the next strip or slide into the projector to project it out onto the screen. And that's what you're doing. You're projecting it into your conscious awareness to see it in, in that, you know, illusionary 3d form. Here's the, here's the last thing I'll add on that. That's also helped me 
And this opens up a big conversation, but I'm going to keep it really short. I've always played around with this idea. It's kind of similar to what I hear people say. You know how people say, like, create the space for what you're manifesting? Like, if you want a new car, like, clean out the garage and get the Mm -hmm. space ready. And I know you've talked Uh about that. But I look at that, but from a little different angle, which is I've identified the thing I want. And I believe what helps to call it in is identifying and delivering what that thing I'm manifesting needs from me. And so from the car example, it's like, I want to manifest a new car. It's like, well, if I had that car, what would it need from me? Well, it would need a nice space in the garage. You know, it would need all the cleaning materials to keep it nice and clean if I'm going to clean myself or whatever. And I would start to prepare that and get it ready for that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I, I talk about this all the time in business, but like people want to manifest more sales and money in their business, but that's the dream or the vision or the next milestone, the next manifestation but they're actually not doing, it's the same thing you said too about not changing. Like people don't want to change, but then get the different results. Part of change is, well, I need to give what this thing needs yes. in order for it to thrive. Here's a great example of this. You want to sit here and say, I want to, I want to manifest a million dollars. And you go, okay, like, you mean like winning the lot? No, like in my business. Okay. So like you want thousands of customers to come flooding in. Do you have Mm -hmm. the infrastructure set up for that? Do you have the customer support systems? Do you have the tech for it? Do you have the email database system to support? Well, no. It's like, you know, we're still in a 3D construct. And if you don't have that in place, you actually don't want thousands of customers because that would be a nightmare. The problems that would suddenly be bestowed upon you and the stress, you don't actually want that. And so a lot of times people aren't thinking through that. It's like, yeah. what would be the fertile ground and the environment that would allow for this to thrive naturally? I think that's the bringing together of the feminine and masculine energies. Like if you think about it from a yogic perspective, you have these two forces that are working together that produce yeah. the experience of the asana postures. And in, in yoga, we would say sukha versus stira. Sukha is like the ease the yen, the relaxation, the effortlessness within the pose. It it literally translates in Sanskrit to mean like sweet space. But then there's the stira, which is like the discipline, the effort, the muscular tension, the sweat. And those two things have to come together. And I think sometimes people look at manifesting and they think, oh, it's just all about sitting and putting myself in the right vibration. And then it's going to magnetize and vibrate to me when actually there can be an effort required. Like I think the coolest thing, well, there's a few things that I've manifested. I'm like, wow, that is a living dream. But my role on team Wedmore right now is a nine year manifestation where almost a decade ago, I wrote down I want to be a performance coach that's relied upon to go into teams and businesses, identify and diagnose what is the breakdown and then deliver the breakthrough. That's literally what she just did the past year. But, but what I did was as soon as I wrote that down, first of all, when I wrote it, I was working for Lululemon and I really, really was attached to inside of Lululemon. Like Uh, I even know who I wanted to work for Mm -hmm. and what department I wanted to be on. And I remember the moment where I deleted that or I was like, Backspace, backspace, backspace. Yeah. It doesn't have to be a little because I, I was attached to how it was going right. to show up. And then I had to think through, okay, where am I at right now? Now, what type of person would that be naturally a byproduct of? What books have they read? What courses have they taken? What results have they produced? Mm -hmm. What actions do they take every day? And I got to work like it was urgent. And I actually had friends who would watch me like read. I remember during the pandemic, the first three weeks of lockdown, I read 23 books and and it was like, are you trying to become John Travolta and phenomenon? What is happening right here? And I was like, I just have this sense that there's this urgency around, I have to become this phenomenal coach. And I would have had no idea that in a year and a half, I would be presented with an opportunity to do what I do now on Team Wedmore. But my actions and my behavior went about that manifestation as if it was urgent and it required actions yeah. from me yeah. in and, order, it, and then all of a sudden it became a reality. Well, and I think it, I also heard in that the whole concept and that was in the Kevin Trudeau tapes about the expanding the circumference of the sonar screen from yes. a three inch diameter. We're looking for in where inside the organization already exists or inside what I'm known. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like this could happen mm-hmm. in 
so many other different places. Yeah, I think that like even that goes around. I've coached people in how to attract their dream relationship too. And I always say like, who do you need to become in order that that relationship would just be natural? Like your ideal partner would just be naturally attracted to that woman of you. I literally, so back in 2017, end of 2017, I remember being at a Tony Robbins event and like, it was a 10 day event, life and wealth mastery. And I had partners throughout the whole thing. The first time I had one partner, then he left because he wasn't going to do wealth mastery. So I switched partners and it was a single guy and me, and we developed like a really great friendship by the end of it. And I was constantly talking about my fiance because that's what Brennan was. He was my fiance at the time. And he was like, man, I want to manifest my soulmate. And I'm like, I will help you. That's what I do for a living. (laughs) And so we sat down and that's really where I defined my manifestation process was with him. I said, all right, what do you want? Let's list her out. What does she look like? What are her values? How is she like, what are her characteristics? Just as many details. Like how does she she make you feel? Yeah, exactly. Like Mm -hmm. she's sitting right in front of you right now. Mm -hmm. He's like, all right, I got this. And the second thing, and I was like, and who must you become in order to attract her? Yes. And he's like, I just got chills. Never thought about that one before. I'm like, I know that's why she's not here yet. So let's get to work on that. And he's like, you know what? You're right. I can be more patient. I can be this. I can be that. Like he just went into this whole it was ju- the list was just as long as the what do I want list, which yeah. a lot of people don't realize is that who must I become list mm-hmm. yeah. is what bridges the gap. And then I'm like, now you take action. Now you actually mm-hmm. become that person. Yes. And it and actually take- it, it gives you like a that's what has you sustain it. Because some people are like, you pull it in, but then it goes out and it's like, well, if you didn't become who you need to become in order to hold the container of what you just created, Mm -hmm. it's going to fall through your hands. And how many examples do we have of this? We have the the people that win the lotto and then lose the money. Right. We've had these people that are, you know, these like overnight business successes, but they're gone the next day. And you have people that become really famous really fast. And then these tragic things happen to them or these TikTok stars, they can't handle the attention, the money, the fame, all that type of stuff. It's like this power, this frequency. It's a muscle. I mean, I've, I, I, this is where I say things that kind of, I try to take a lot of these concepts and conversations we're having and make them a little bit more digestible for someone that isn't necessarily here and ready to have this conversation, but I'll say things to the effect of your business will grow to the level of problems that you can handle because there's yes. some certain mm-hmm. frequency that you can mm-hmm. hold and not that. And that's also another interesting thing because this has come up with clients in the past where and I don't know what your experience has been here, Catherine, where people will get to a certain level and then they're like afraid they're going to lose that. Mm-hmm. And so now it's less about where's the next level. Like where's that, as we were saying before, that next brands to yeah. jump from. It's like, no, no, no. How, like, I, I don't even, I think this is still a fluke. And it's like, what do you mean is a fluke? Like you got here. The fact that you got here means you can get here again anytime you want. That's yes. new, the new set point. That's the new I have a metaphor neutral. for that. Yeah. That worked so well for me. My coach gave me this metaphor because I was struggling with something along the lines of I'm afraid I'm going to lose it. Yep. It's a fear that came up for me when I got pregnant because my mom, literally, it was the end of her life, quote unquote, when she got pregnant with me because it kept her bound to my father for much longer than she ever wow. needed to be with him. And I was processing so much of that through my birth, through my pregnancy and all this stuff. So I really did develop a fear of like, what if motherhood makes me lose everything, Mm -hmm. which didn't make conscious sense. Like, why would I lose everything? That makes absolutely no sense, but subconsciously made complete sense to me. And I was working with my coach and she gave me this brilliant metaphor. And basically she said, have you ever gone to like the fair or something where they have all these, they have like these glass vessels that you fill with sand. It's like a layer of sand, then you put a layer of green sand or whatever. That's what life is. Every experience that you have in life, you're putting sand into this vessel. And when you have all these experiences layered on top of each other, you're only layering the next sand over the previous sand. You're not losing any sand. It's not like you're ever dug Mm -hmm. sand out. It's just layering on top of one or the other. There's no such thing as going backwards in life. There's no such thing as regression. Some layers of sand are skinnier than others. Some are bigger than others. Some are the colors that you like and some of the colors that you maybe don't like, but you're constantly moving forward and you're not losing the vibration that got you to where you're, where you are. 
And so therefore you can always rebuild it because you have that experience yes, yes. in your little vessel. And, and I was like, oh my God, yes. You, and you have, uh, you know, you're, you do this stuff long enough and like, you're going to have experiences. And I've had these where as you grow and change, certain things you've created in the past have to be destroyed, have to burn mm -hmm. down, have to break apart because it's like, I'm trying to think of a good metaphor on the spot, but it's like, if you built, I got uh, one. I, well, I'll try one and you see if you okay. can, you can top that. <laughs> it's like, if I built a foundation for a home and then I say, okay, cool. Now I want to build a skyscraper. Well, I'm going to have to tear down the home. I may even need to build a new foundation that can hold right. the skyscraper. Uh -huh. yes. And so, but it doesn't mean that I've lost exactly what you're saying. Like lost that I can always go build that home again. Because mm -hmm. I've done that. You know and how I, to. Yeah. Yes. And that whole, that whole, like, I think that's one of the best affirmations. You can say the fact that I've done blank means I can do it again. Yes. You know, and I think that's yeah. just so, such a simple, powerful truth. All right. Top that's that, actually, top that metaphor. Well, Jen. You're, now we're segueing into intuition because you read my mind. That's, that's actually the metaphor that I teach with one of the meditations that I teach inside of manifesting something that you really want. It's called the empty space, which is all about associating a positive context with not having the thing that you want yet. And, yeah, if you, that's and, and the thing is, is that we're reminded of that in nature all the time. Like in order to take an inhale, you have to take an exhale. There has to be room. You can't inhale forever. But in <laughs> the law of manifestation, humans walk about their life as if you can build a house on a house. I got that and now I just want more and more and more and more and more. And there's no recognition of that nature actually has duality to it. There's an in and an out. There's a yeah. give and a take. Destruction there's, and creation. There's a night and a day. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and you can see that play out everywhere in the laws. And I think of nature as like, a place to look at what are the, what's the operating system for this 3d reality, Clues. you know, like that's, there's laws to the universe. And it's like in this 3d manifestation reality, there's duality, there's yoga, there's union, there's, you know, male, female, night, day on off up down. Everything is a vibration, which is basically just an on off switch. So if that's the case, then in order to have something, you also have to have nothing. So, you know, when you look at, if I'm going to create something, in 3D reality, we would find it very normal to say, I'm going to build a new house. And the first thing that would arrive is the demolition crew. But suddenly that happens in someone's actual life. And they're like, what? Yeah. This is evidence that it's all falling apart. I knew when the other like, shoe was going to drop. Yes, it was only a matter like, of time. Wait a minute, yeah. wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah. What if the universe is mm -hmm. actually fulfilling your order and saying, it's make yes, James, I will bring that in. But first we got to make some room here. Boop. And Boop, that's boop, my, that's the boop, boop, boop. wrecking boop. ball coming in. Yeah. That's the uh, demolition crew. Back okay. it up. We are officially right at two hours and I think <laughs> it's like right at two hours. I think it's a, it's a wonderful moment to start to wrap up a, uh, an amazing discussion. So I want to thank both of you guys for taking the time, especially Catherine of your very busy schedule being a new mom to come on the, the show. Any final thoughts or comments before we wrap this one up? I think that I was a very intuitive that. place to end. <laughs> I just want to add that every time we're together, it's like never ending. Like we could spend 10 hours together all night, every night, all day, every day. <laughs> it's just the best. So this is it just, is. A and, and this is really that. what we talk about when we're together too. This is, <laughs> true. Yeah. So it's true. Like, we're like, that's, shouldn't we record this? Well, I think that's how we came up with the idea was we're, this yeah. is just our dinner party conversation. We're like, we should have microphones. We should just record it. <laughs> yeah. So no, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Jen, any final? Any no, I'm ready thoughts? to talk about my favorite topic, intuition. Yeah. I knew you were going to say next. that. I know. I'm ready. I'm ready for you to be the star of that one. Oh. <laughs> I know you have a lot to say. My goodness. You know, my first manifestation story that I told about the first time I manifested was about Jen. Was me. Yeah. Uh -huh. Those Tony Robin tickets uh -huh. was for Jen. Full circle moment. Here it is. I used to talk about that story for years. Now you're on the show and we're talking about it. Pretty cool. Thank you both for coming on. Thank you to all of our listeners for hanging out, listening to us for two hours. Really appreciate it. <laughs> if you've made it to the end, let us know. Wow. It's not even the end yet. We have another part three is the coming. The secret word is taco. So you just send <laughs> us. Comment below. <laughs> send us, send us a DM saying taco, taco. <laughs> and then we will know. Because we taco love. Or, or almond milk. Almond milk. <laughs> tacos with a glass of almond milk. <laughs> <laughs>
It's my day right there. Uh, okay. <laughs> Have a wonderful rest of your day and stay tuned for part three on this series where we're going to get into intuition, into whoop, whoop. intuition. I we're see gonna, what you did there. We're going to get intuition. <laughs> How much is it? How much is your tuition into the intuition, intuitive intuition class? Zero dollars. <laughs> Stay tuned. We'll see you next time on the Mind Your Business podcast. 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 On the Mind Your Business podcast.